Welcome to the Filmed Live Musicals podcast, a podcast about stage musicals that have been legally filmed and publicly distributed. The Filmed Live Musicals website contains information on nearly 200 musicals that have been captured live. Check it out at filmedlivemusicals.com. And now, on with the show. Welcome to the Filmed Live Musicals podcast. I'm your host, Louisa Lyons, and today we are talking about the musical Kisses on a Postcard by Terence Frisbee. The musical tells the true story of brothers Terry and Jack Frisbee, who were evacuated from London to Cornwall during World War II. At terms heartwarming and heart-wrenching, funny and devastating, Kisses on a Postcard is an intimate telling of the ways in which war impacts everyday people. My guest today is Terry's son, Dominic Frisbee, a comedian, composer, and financial writer who, I, who adapted Kisses on a Postcard into an audio musical during lockdown. Welcome, Dominic. Thank you very much, Louisa. Uh, what a pleasure it is to be here. I am just so excited to talk to you about this gorgeous show. Your dad, Terence Frisbee, was, had an extraordinary career in theatre and television. Can you give us a quick summary of his work? Yeah, he's most famous. He wrote the longest running comedy in the history of the West End. Well, it was the longest running comedy. It's since been overtaken, but it broke all records. It was called There's a Girl in My Soup, and it ran from 1966 to 1972. And it made the fortune of the legendary uh, West End producer Michael Codron, and it starred Donald Sindon and John Pertwee. And it was then made into a film with Peter Sellers and Goldie Hawn, which was quite a successful film. And so he enjoyed extraordinary success. Mm -hmm. And he wrote a, a sitcom uh, in the 1970s that was ITV's most popular sitcom, all about two brothers, two Cockney brothers uh, in South East London. And it featured David Jason. But it wasn't actually Only Fools and Horses, but it was the sort of prototype, if you like, for Only Fools and Horses. And it, yeah, he had an extraordinary like at times incredibly successful and then at times incredibly unsuccessful career as a writer, actor, man of the theatre. But he always said, Kisses on a Postcard is the best thing I ever wrote. And when did he first, when did Kisses on a Postcard, when was it first written? Well, it began life as a radio play in the 1980s and it was called the radio play was called Just Remember Two Things, It's Not Fair and Don't Be Late. And that was Dad's motto. It was a piece of advice once given to him. And, and so he called the show that. And it was a series of reminiscences about his time as an evacuee during World War II. And it then got option to be one, the radio play of the year. And it got it even had letters from people in Germany who'd been evacuated to escape mm -hmm. Allied bombing. You know, the, the message was that oh. universal. And it then got option to be a film and it got stuck in development hell for, for nearly 20 years. And then there was a curious chain of circumstances and it became a stage musical. And that, I, I saw it in 2003 and it was a sort of semi-professional community theatre project in North Devon. And it just blew me away. I, I, I've had the theatre shoved down my throat since an early age and I've got mixed feelings about it. Sometimes you see stuff that's amazing, but you see a lot of stuff that's, you know, pretty bad. And so, but I just, I fell in love with the show and I suddenly understood why dad was so obsessed with the theatre. You know, he, he died in April, 2020, but right up to the week he died, he was still going to the theatre two to three times a week. He just loved it. Anyway, he d when he died and I just knew how good this musical was and I was going through his stuff and I found a CD and I found the script when I was clearing his stuff and I just I don't know why I just took it home and every day I, during the lockdown I'd, I'd go and sit at my desk to do some work and the script and the CD were just staring at me and I remember thinking you know if I don't do something with this nobody is and nobody will know about this project and you, to make a film would require millions, billion, tens of millions, probably to turn it into a stage musical would also require millions. But I've got a background in voiceovers and audio work. And I thought, you know, why don't I make a, 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 a an audio book musical, a podcast musical version of this? And so I took all the different versions of the story, the stage musical. It was also a book, uh, the original radio play. And I'm instead of like, 
making it really tight and keeping it to two hours like a stage musical. I thought, no, I'm going to go full Joe Rogan with this. And it's a four and a half hour, you know, 10 episodes uh, each about around about half an hour. And it's a full, you know, it's a it's like a big audio book or something. Only we had a cast of 50, a 15 piece orchestra. It was recorded at Abbey Road. So the audio is pretty special. Mm. Do you have a recording of the original radio play? I do. Or is that lost to time? Ooh. I do. And there is one online. If you Google it, you can find it. It's on some weird archive site. And it's good. <laughs> it's really good. It's 90 minutes. But this is, you know, this is one stage further what we've done. Yeah. Who produced the radio play? I don't know the answer to that. I, I do know, but I'd have to look it up. I, I haven't got the... Um, yeah. Inid, would it be Inid Williams? I think she might, might, might have been Inid Williams, and I think she was quite a big okay. uh, radio producer in the eight, 70s and 80s. So it, it started as a, as a radio play, and then your dad also published a book based on that story. Yeah, he wrote a book with Bloomsbury, and that would have been published maybe 2010, 2011, something like that. The book's nice. It's great, the book. And he really did made the book to advertise the stage show. But mm -hmm. for one reason or another, it never got made into a West End show. And um, uh, but hopefully mm. now with more people listening to the podcast, you know, it'll get some. The, the problem with putting it's got a cast of maybe 30 or 40 and it's got 15 or 20 kids in it. And to do that as a West End show is, is quite a big undertaking. And if you're a producer in the West End, you're going to go. Well, I can either do a jukebox musical or I can do a rerun of a Oliver or The Sound of Music or something that's got some brand awareness. To take a big risk on an unknown project like this, you know, I don't blame the producers for for not wanting to risk that that mm. level of money. It's it seems to me it would be a perfect show to license because there's you know community theaters are always looking for shows that have big casts and that are have good music and good stories, and this fits the bill for that. Yeah, there have been there have been shows around the country. Uh, there was one in Nottingham, I think. But yeah, it's 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 a big undertaking. That's all I can say. <laughs> but it's worth it. <laughs> I've, oh, totally worth it. I truly, when I was listening to this podcast in the car on to and from work, it made me so emotional. I was crying in the car. It was, it's just such a beautiful story that needs to be heard and there's there's so so much depth to it uh so let's let's dive into the story a little bit before we get to the recording can you talk us through the story sure so i'll talk you through the first 20 minutes and you'll understand why it's called kisses on a postcard <laughs> <laughs> um well you already know but your listener will will understand why it's called kisses on a postcard so it's 1940 in southeast london in deptford the last soldiers have just come back from Dunkirk and the Battle of Britain is about to begin. Those were the words of Churchill. And they know that the German bombers are coming to bomb all the cities in the country. And so this directive came out from the government that all the children in the cities were to be evacuated to the countryside in order to escape the German bombs. And Dad was seven. Uh, Terry was seven and his brother Jack was 11 and their parents weren't going. Your mum could only come with you if you were under the age of five. So all you knew was that your city was about to be bombed and you were saying goodbye to your kids. You were putting them on a train. You didn't know where they were going. You didn't know how long they'd be going for and you didn't know who they'd be staying with. You were just literally putting your kids on a train into the unknown. And you didn't know if you would ever see your kids again. Can you imagine what kind of a wrench that was for families across the country? And something like between three and a half and four million kids across cities across the UK were evacuated to the countryside. And it's the largest movement of people in our country's history. It's an extraordinary mm -hmm. episode, and, and there have been some stories about it, but it's, it's an incredibly untold story. And so those were the circumstances, and the show begins with uh, Mum, my grandma, tying some labels onto Jack and Terry's neck with their name on it and their form class. 
That's how they'd be identified. And the kids are going, where are we going? And she's going, I don't know. And But in order to turn the thing into an adventure for them, Grandma gave them a secret code. And when they got to where they were going, and the kids are going where, and Grandma doesn't, and Mum doesn't know, the postcard wrote, it was addressed to Mum back home, and the postcard said, Dear Mum and Dad, arrived safe and well, love Jack and Terry. And they were to put the address of wherever they ended up on the postcard. And at all costs, the two boys were to stay together. And the kids are going, well, what's the code? And mum says, here's the code. You put one kiss, if it's horrible, and I'll come straight down there and get you. You put two kisses, if it's okay. And you put three kisses, if it's nice. And then I'll know. So that was the code, kisses on a postcard. So mum packs their bags, they've got a gas mask, their label round their neck with the na- name on it, the postcard in their, in, the, um, in their bags, a little packed lunch, and she walks them down to the train station and everyone else from their school is walking down to the train station, Creek Road Secondary in Deptford. And then there's this scene where all the kids get onto the train and the mums are just left there standing on the platform waving goodbye to their kids. And off goes the train across London, down through Surrey and Wiltshire and Dorset. It keeps on going all the way through Somerset and Devon. And eventually the train pulls up in Liscard in Cornwall. And all all the kids get off the train. And, you know, all the while this is going on, we've got we're singing songs and there's all the action on the train. And you get the whole journey through the through the. um, south of england from from london down to the down to cornwall and for those of your listeners that don't know cornwall it's the sort of bottom left the southwest corner of of britain it's the most remote one of the most remote parts of the country and they get to liscard and they're all put put in buses and the buses are taken taken to various villages around the country and dad and his brother uh, and along with about 40 other kids from his school are taken to a little village called dobwalls and they're all herded into the village hall and they say, you know, it's all smells of the countryside and there are all these strange Cornish accents. They've never heard a Cornish accent before. The Cornish dialect was very different to the language spoken around the rest of the UK. And they're made to stand in the centre of the village hall and all the locals are standing round. And the expression was, I'll have that one there. Oh. And they were each picked out like, like, you know, cattle in a cattle market. Dad always called it the cattle market. And their destiny was sealed (laughs) in that moment. And not only their destiny, but the destiny of the families that they were coming to stay with as well. Mm. And um, you can imagine all these Cockney kids arriving in a tiny Cornish village, which had never seen Cockney kids before. It turned the whole village upside down. Anyway, Dad and his brother were chosen by a Welsh couple who had moved down to Cornwall from Wales after World War I. Um, They didn't know this at the time, but he was a a Welsh miner who had fought in uh, World War I in the trenches. And he was one of, he was in a regiment called the Welsh Bantams, who were all under five foot four in height. They were all tiny. And they'd come Mm. up against the, the Prussian guard, who were all over six foot. And there had been this terrible massacre called the Mammoth's Wood Massacre. And he was one of just 17 to have survived this massacre. And he went back. He was the only one who went back to his village. And and because of the pressure of him being the only one to come back to the village, him and his wife had to leave the village. And that's how they'd ended up in Cornwall. And he was um, deeply anti-authoritarian, anti-war, a sort of old school socialist of the Ernest Bevin, that kind of school. And his wife and his wife was just this lovely. Caring woman, giving woman. And they were, they were Auntie Rose and Uncle Jack to the whole village. And he now worked as a plate layer on the Great Western Railway. And so they were picked up by this couple. They didn't know any of this at this point. And they were taken back to their house. And it was a tiny, tiny cottage at the end of a row of seven cottages down by the railway line because he worked on the railways. Number seven railway cottages. And they went into this house and there was no electricity just oil lamps 
and there was a cat asleep by the hearth and there was a canary in a cage and they had this son, Uncle Jack and Auntie Rose had this son who was a young soldier called Gwyn. He was about 18 or 20 years old. And outside in the yard, there was a pig and chickens. And then uh, there was a valley to explore, woods to explore, a tour to climb. And best of all, there was the railway, the London to Penzance line at the end of um, their, their um, at the end of, you know, at the end of their back garden. And so this always makes me cry when I tell this story. So if I, you hear me stuttering, it's because I'm trying not to cry. <laughs> and so this first song that we're going to play now um, occurs at the end of their first day. And it's about 20 minutes. I should say, when they arrived at this house and I've, everything I just described, Dad and, Dad and his brother thought they had died and gone to heaven. <laughs> they thought it was fantastic. Now, many of the kids had awful experiences as Vakis during the war, but Dad called it his second childhood, and he said it was one of the happiest times of his life. But anyway, this first song that we're going to play is The Two Boys, played by Brandon McGuinness and Frankie Joel Cialoni, two young boys from London, and it takes place on the first night in this cottage and they've just got a candle as light and they're in a single bed in a mattress on the floor top and tailing in the mattress and they're deciding how many kisses to put on their card how many kisses i vote three what would mum and dad think of it here don't know no electricity they wouldn't like that i don't care there's no bathroom i don't care <laughs> Outside love, all they have I can't go in an outside love I don't mind, I don't care What if it's freezing cold out there? That's what the bot's for, don't you see? I vote one, I vote three Just one bed, got to share All squashed up in it, I don't care This is on a postcard, we must write Something we've got to really, isn't it? Like being on holiday, only there's no seat. We don't have to stop at four. Let's do hundreds! Yeah! Oh. 
let's hurry. Look at them, fast asleep, and they've covered the card in kisses. Night, night, boys. Oh, it's it's so moving and so beautiful, and the music is so delightful and so touching. It's I I just love the tone of it. Um, th- so many different characters are introduced throughout the musical. There's Auntie Rose and Uncle Jack, as you spoke about, um, and Gwyn. Uh, and then um, a young girl from the village, or, and she's another vacu, right, Elsie? She was actually evacuated. Or she's she's from like a local, Plymouth. sort of local. Yeah, she was evacuated mm-hmm. from Plymouth, which was about twenty or thirty miles away, and um, her mm. fa- her mother had run off with a sailor, and her father was lost in action in Burma. But she was about five or six years old, older than Dad. Mm. But he always said she taught him the facts of life <laughs> as a as a little boy. <laughs> <laughs> they would have their little hut in the woods that they escaped to. But then as she grew older, when she was 16, 17, and soldiers started to appear in the village prior to D-Day, first uh, the British soldiers and then eventually the American soldiers, um, she lost interest in dad and uh, only, <laughs> you know, had an interest for the American, for the soldiers, especially the American ones. And one of the amazing things is this village called Dobwalls, it really is, in the middle of nowhere. But the American soldiers that were billeted on the village prior to D-Day were all, was a regiment of GIs all from Louisiana. And it was one of those regiments of black GIs. And they were all black regiments. And they'd been, they'd been sent to this village in Cornwall. And, you know, nobody in this village had, you know, it, English were, were foreigners. Um, Americans were from Mars, but black Americans, you know, and it's a great moment in the story. Dad said he was given a tap dancing lesson on a sheet of plywood by a man from New Orleans itself uh, outside the the, um, barracks. But anyway, Elsie runs off with uh, the soldiers and actually gets pregnant by them. And uh, she doesn't know who the father is. And not only, you know, there were quite a few um, um, British women who became pregnant by American soldiers during uh, World War Two, and they were sent off to homes for fallen women they were sent off to. Um, but actually, in the action of this play, this is towards the end of the show, uh, when she falls pregnant, she's going to be sent off to a home for fallen women. And of course, the big scandal was that the baby was was mixed race, uh, mm. you know, even bigger scandal than 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 having a, 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 a child by an American. And they thought she thought they were going to take the kid away from her. But in order to stop that happening, Auntie Rose and Uncle Jack took her in. Um, and this is a, you know, a great moment in the play. But we could play, we could play one of her songs now, if you like. Sure, um, yes. This is, a, this is a sort of fantasy number, if you like. But it's when she's... She knows she's pregnant and she dreams that one of the soldiers who's since gone off to D-Day is going to come back, come back and and get her after the war. G.I. Bride? G.I. Bride, exactly. My mum ran off with a jolly jack tar and left me all at sea. This forgotten part of England has been a cage to me I want to see the world I want to get away I would love somebody to love me so every night I pray I want to be a GI bride I want to try Stop and stare I want to be a G.I. bride I want to wed a swell G.I. I want to kiss this place goodbye We'll be so glamorous and know so amorous I want to be a G.I. bride He'll say gee whiz Have slicked back hair He'll buy me fancy clothes And nylon underwear We'll dance the jitterbug And do the Susie Q We'll have a big white house And some children too I want to be a G.I. bride Before you know, we'll be stateside We'll make such a splash as 
as we spend all our cash, I want to be a GI bride. I love this how the um where's the American soldiers come in that um jazz style comes in the 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 swing music uh, yeah. becomes a, the style of the show. Yeah, that's great. And um, we got, we, I mean, there's a 15 piece orchestra and the guy uh, who wrote a lot of the music, Martin Wheatley, is from that kind of swing culture. And so he just knows all the best musicians in the country at playing that type of music. <laughs> so, yeah, the swing numbers, we had like, we got two like of the really good saxophonists and, and, um, yeah, you can hear it in that number, and there's another good number when the when the soldiers all arrive, and there's a good number for the kids and the soldiers. Gum chum, we could play that at mm. some point. Maybe talk a bit more and play that one in a little bit. Yeah, as you're talking, so often with like um, bio- biographical musicals, um, or, and even autobiographical mu- autobiographical musicals, there's a little bit of artistic license taking. There's you know characters are smished, like real life people are smished into one character, and um, there's kind of fictionalized uh, events take place. It sounds like most of Kisses at a Postcard is true to real life. Well, it's interesting that you should ask that. And, you know, it's a true story, but at the same time, Dab was a dramatist. Mm -hmm. And in those days, uh, you know, we didn't record stuff in the way that we record stuff now with the internet and everything. And so that story just lived in dad's head for, so let's say he went back home in 1944 and he would, he eventually wrote the radio play in 1986. So that's 40 years. That story just lived in his head. And so the only time he would have revived it was when he talked to his brother. So I'm And I know that the character of uncle Jack is basically dad if that makes sense. You know, it's Uncle yeah. Jack. Because he was a soldier and he suffered all these things. But like Uncle Jack has this great line. So Gwyn, the, the boy, is gets killed in uh, Sicily. And this is true. This is Uncle Jack and Auntie Rose's son, Gwyn, was killed in action in Sicily. Um, but then the reaction of un- Uncle Jack when all that happens, um, you know, dad wrote that because he would have just, Mm. all dad remembered is he just would just go and sit at the end of the garden by himself and stop going to work and just would just sit there, as you can imagine, if you lost your son. But so dad wrote him, wrote one of the lines, never, 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 never trust your leaders. Churchill's a hero. Montgomery's a hero. Gwyn is dead. And it's not just this war or the last, it's all history. Into the valley of death rode the 600. Who sent them there, eh? Now, that's a wonderful line. And I don't think Uncle Jack ever said that. Mm -hmm. Because he would have had to, to get the never, 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 he would have had to have read King Lear, (laughs) which is what (laughs) the reference to, and he would have to know his Tennyson. And Dad was, you know, quite a cultured man, and so he knew all of that. So, he invented, he wrote that, he composed it, but it was the sentiment that Uncle Jack would have been feeling at the time. And I thought he'd invented yeah. the thing about the black GIs. Um, because musically, it's wonderful because it means we can bring this whole jazz swingy thing into the, sh- into the show. But I've since done some research and found out that a, a regiment from Louisiana was billeted on that village. And then I met an old lady who was married, not to one of the Vaki kids, but to one of the local kids with whom dad played, who lived like three cottages up. And she said, no, there was a big scandal because one of the Vaki girls had become pregnant by one of the uh, black soldiers. It was a big scandal. So that story was true as well. But again, it's it's heightened and the stories are adapted and and by somebody who knows how to tell a story put it that way Mm, yeah which doesn't make it any less powerful in it's probably makes it more powerful (sighs) 
truly and the the human element of what I loved about this show especially was how it portrayed the history of war. So with Uncle Jack, we we have an, an in into the experiences of soldiers during the Great War, yeah. the war to end all wars, inverted commas, and how devastating it was for that generation. And then and the fact that Auntie Rose and Uncle Jack had to mo- leave Wales because he was the only man that came back to their village. And then how that played into their experience of the Second World War and just the ongoing tragedy of the, the you know, young men being used as cannon fodder and, and how it affected the women too. Yeah, I mean, you definitely don't come out of it pro-war. Mm. <laughs> Not that anyone is particularly pro-war beforehand. Um, last year, this time last year, I was... Uh, in, in on a skiing holiday with a group of friends and we had to drive back from the um the chalet where we were staying back to the airport it was a one hour's drive and so i was still you know testing people out with this the show it hadn't published yet i was just was just playing it to friends and stuff to get a reaction so i played the first hour in the car um while we both drove back through the mountains to geneva airport to my friends and this was the, the the scene with the evacuation of the kids from London down to the countryside and how all the kids... And you may remember when the Ukrainian kids were the, evacuated, people were just writing name tags on the Ukrainian kids. And so, and this was obviously just after Putin had invaded Ukraine and everyone in the car just said, this is happening now. Yeah. This is happening now. And and it is, or it was this time last year. And And, you know, it's even though it's a specific story about the evacuation of the English kids, the theme of evacuation is a pretty universal one and a pretty timeless one. Mm. And how, who we take care of and how we take care of them Yeah. in, in these terrible times. And I, th- I think that's one of the most powerful things about the show. The story mm. is the incredible humanity, particularly of auntie Rose and uncle Jack, taking in these two kids, then losing their own son, then taking in um, Elsie and this mixed race kid, you know, they were, uh, you know, what what, they were just, they just showed incredible humanity Mm. while enduring the most terrible tragedy in their own lives. Yeah. I, a couple of things I want to say there, the, in the opening scenes when we're experiencing this uh, train ride from London to um, um, Cornwall, Cornwall, the the detail and the richness of, you know, we are at that train station and we can literally hear all the people around you, um, but the, the detail of what it was like to see, like, London going past you and, and going out into the countryside and that the vivid detail of that, I've, I've not seen or heard a um, a war story that has that level of detail for the traveling part, which is such a, a crucial part of the story. But it was, it's just, it, every detail is brought to vivid life. Oh, well, I'm delighted you said that because I wrote half of that. <laughs> 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 and I wrote that well, song. Well done. <laughs> it, was all from, it was all from dad's stuff. And dad comes from that mm. generation of, of people who, my granddad, his dad worked on the railways And they just, him and his brother just love trains. They love steam trains. And you know, there's that generation of English people who just, or British people, I should say, who just are in love with trains. And dad was part (laughs) of that. And so, yeah, and we had the steam train and we had all the steam effects and the sound of the platform. And we had a really good um, audio designer, a guy called Ross Berman. And we were intermingling it with the music. And then the kids are singing all the place names of the places they go past. And, And I was like looking at the maps of the, all the places between where the train stops, uh, all the stations that you go through, desperately trying to find place names that rhyme <laughs> so that the song worked. But fortunately, uh, the gods of the train stations were on my side and I was able to make them all rhyme. How lucky you were that it wasn't said in Wales. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been more difficult. I, I'll say. <laughs> English place names are difficult, but not as hard as Welsh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Did Auntie Rose and Uncle Jack stay in your dad's life or um, 
Oh, sorry. Yeah, um, after they came back. His brothers, yeah, Terry and um Well Jack. When Gwyn and when Gwyn died, this is one of the most emotional scenes in the in the show. Mm. Dad and his brother wrote a letter home to their parents saying that only dad was going to come back because he'd just won a scholarship to Dartford Grammar and that Jack was going to stay in Cornwall. Sorry, it makes me cry. <laughs> mm-hmm. Dad was going to stay in Cornwall. Uh, sorry, Jack was going to stay in Cornwall and become Auntie Rose and Uncle Jack's son. And it was fair because each they would have one kid each and that was fair. And they wrote that letter. Mm. But in the end, Auntie Rose and Uncle Jack, they took in Elsie. And so they, uh, Dad went home. And everybody asks me this question. Did he stay in touch with them? And I wish I knew the answer. I don't know. And I like to think he must have done. Mm. But um, he would have, I'm sh- he must have written some letters. But I just think over time and the communications available in those days and you know by the time he came back to london he would have been a 11 12 year old boy he spent four years down there and you know what teenage boys are like they're wrapped up in themselves and you know it has to be their mum to tell them to do things like writing letters and you know i i believe he might have done it for a bit but then he became a teenager and and things happen when you're a teenager and i just think they will have gradually drifted apart I, I don't mm. think he knew when they died, for example. Mm. But um, Rose Phillips and Jack Phillips, that was the name of the couple. And um, I guess I should go and look them up on uh, in the coroner's reports, in the death registries and, and, and yeah. find out a bit more. But but anyway, their story... And Elsie too, I, I'd love to know her story and, and her son. I will say this. The character... Elsie Pierce, who was the girl who taught uh, Dad the facts of life, mm-hmm. in an earlier incarnation in the story, she had a different surname. And mm. Dad had misremembered her surname and he'd given her the surname of somebody else. And the person who had that surname had actually approached Dad after the one of the earlier productions and said, look, you're bringing my name into disrepute (laughs) by saying that I had a black kid with an American GI. It wasn't me. It was somebody else. And so there was, there was stuff that dad got wrong. So that she was caught, she had a different surname and we changed her surname to Elsie Pierce. And so we don't actually know what Mm. her actual surname was. So she'd be harder to find out, but Mm. I will say this about auntie Rose and uncle Jack, like, and and like the beauty of like, had I put this on as a stage show, when the curtain came down on the last night, it would be over. But because I've done it as a as a podcast and I've put it on the internet, I've sort of it will last as long as the internet lasts, if you see what I mean. So I've 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 sort of yep. oh, yep. s- semi immortalized the story, if you like. Immortalize is a bit of a grandiose word, but you know what I mean. I've made it I've made it exist as a thing. So at any stage and, in the future. And shared the story with a new generation of people. Well, and that too. So even if I don't know what happened in real life to Auntie Rose and Uncle Jack, J- Rose and Jack Phillips, and I haven't looked in, in the, the um, death records to see where they ended up, their story is immortalized. And um, mm. that's, that's good. Oh, it's, it's wonderful and beautiful and what extraordinary people that they were to be for many of these families that opened up their homes to children they didn't know and what how traumatic and scary that must have been for the kids to be you know torn away from what they knew and not knowing if they were going to see their parents again and to be for your dad and his brother to be welcomed into this incredibly loving warm home where they were just nothing but taken care of is is just so extraordinary yeah, there are lots of kids who had bad stories. There were kids who were abused. Mm-hmm. There were kids who tried yeah. to run away. And, you know, imagine if you're a family, you know, a happy family with your three or four kids, and then suddenly you bring in three or four more kids from another family. 
it just disrupts your whole family. Mm-hmm. And this, you know, the, the local kids and the Vaki kids were always fighting. And, you know, the Vaki kids were London kids. They were savvy kids. And whereas the local kids were all in this tiny little village, they just weren't as savvy. And dad used to say we were the grey squirrels and they were the red squirrels. And, <laughs> you know, they would organise like games of football for them. And the, the, the Vaki kids would beat the village kids 17 nil or something. And they smashed them at cricket and they would always win the fights. And so the Vaki kids sort of had contempt for the rural kids and the rural kids sort of resented these pushy newcomers who sort of disrupted their lives. Mm. And so it wasn't just the disruption to the parents and the families yeah. in London. It was this disruption to the to the communities where they ended up. And you get the whole story of World mm. War Two from the evacuation to the vet, the bombing of Britain to you know, Montgomery in North Africa and the invasion of Europe and then eventually the end of the war. You get the whole war through the eyes of these two kids. Or no, sorry, through the eyes of this this Cornish village. You get the arrival of the American yeah. soldiers. There's a very dramatic scene when Plymouth gets bombed. And, um, yes. oh. you know, they all the village just watch Plymouth being bombed from the top of the mountain nearby. And, and, and D- Dad and his brother were actually caught up in the bombing. And they they spent the night in a shelter under the uh, under Plymouth Station, and un- Uncle Jack thought he'd lost them, and he thought he'd lost his wife, and then you can imagine his relief when they showed up on the train the next day. So that's another mm. very dramatic episode. Yes, and it remind um the I f- don't remember the little boy whose mother did come with him. Oh, Teddy Willis. Oh, is is that a based on a true story? Too? That's true. That's a true oh, story. No. Oh. And um, th- so this the story there is um, there was one boy called Teddy Willis whose mum came with him because he was less than five at the time of the evacuation. And so his mum came with him and um, he was run over by a, an army jeep and um, killed. And... Uh, you can imagine the mother, she'd been sent down to look after and then his father turns up and she's been sent down to look after him and, and the kid's been run over and killed. And then mm. dad had to carry his, his coffin to the, um, back to the train where they put it on a train to send it back to London. And cause he was, all he can remember about carrying the coffin was that he couldn't get in step with the kid who was carrying the coffin in front of him. And so he was kicking the heels of that boy and that boy's heels were kicking his shins and his shins ended up all cut and bloody while he's carrying, you know, and they had those hobnail boots in those days. So his shins were cut to shreds and then he had to run to school and where he was given six of the best because he was late for school and nobody had told him, the teacher, that he was carrying this kid's coffin. <laughs> so it's one of these really kind of cruel stories, but he, he, he would yeah. tell us that that's, that's very much true. Yeah. Oh, that tears at my heart. It's just absolutely devastating. Picturing this like tiny child carrying another tiny child's coffin. Yeah. It's just absolutely heartbreaking. Um, so how much of the story had been, or how much of the musical rather, had been written by your dad uh, when you picked it up in 2020? Well, dad, um, what actually happened is, so it was optioned to be a film. And then dad's close friend was this guy mm. called Jeremy James Taylor. OBE, none, no less, who founded the National mm-hmm. Youth Music Theatre. And Jeremy had been saying to Dad mm. for years, you've got to turn this into a stage musical. And Dad was going, no, no, we've optioned it to be a film and Ken Loach is going to direct it, and blah, blah, blah. But anyway, one time they were, Dad was nuts about golf, as was Jeremy. And they were members of this golfing society called the Stage Golfing Society, which was basically a golf club <laughs> for unemployed actors. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, one time they were playing golf down in North Devon, Dad and Jeremy, and they came into the clubhouse afterwards and there was a bloke from the local theatre, the Theatre Royal Barnstable, and he said to them, have you two got a project for me? And they looked at each other and they said, well, as a matter of fact, we do. And that's how the stage musical version of Kisses on a Postcard was born. Mm-hmm. And Dad needed someone to write the music. And another guy in the golfing society was this chap called Gordon Clyde, who had been like Dick Emery's sidekick for many years. Um, And Gordon was a sort of musical comedian, but brilliant musician. And, you know, it was just a case of 
dad asked Gordon if he would write the music and Gordon wrote the music. And so he wrote a lot of original songs and then um, uh, he wrote some, uh, a lot of past, um, took original songs from the period and reworded them and adapted them and so mm. on. Now, the problem is that you run into all sorts of copyright issues doing that. And then Gordon <laughs> died in 2008. And so the music wasn't quite complete. And so Dad approached various other people and they all wrote um, a song here and a honk song there. Richard Skinner, Stilgo wrote something and John Altman wrote something and mm. Tom Recknell wrote something. And they did this other version of the show in 2013. And it was better that version it was slicker but the music i think the word is heterogeneous heterogeneous huh. where uh -huh. it's the music was it was almost as though it had been written by too many people so it wasn't one complete style yeah. um so it still needed more work the music and then we came the lockdown came and I was looking at it and I was like well I, I I just literally approached the guy who I write my songs with Martin Wheatley and I said to Martin's a musical genius and nobody knows who he is. He's one of those kind of characters. And I said, Martin, would you be interested in taking this on as a project? And it turned out that Martin's father had been evacuated to Cornwall from South East London as well. So he'd had oh exactly goodness. the same experience. So Martin was very much <sighs> on board with it. And so what we did is we kept all of Gordon's music and then we got rid of the other stuff. And then Martin wrote the music and I wrote the words for probably maybe 50 or 60% of the show in the style that Gordon had established. And then we sort of adapted mm. Gordon's style. Martin made it his own. And we had, cause we made great use of string quartet, um, which is a sort of different angle in a, in a musical. It was all, there was a great deal of the stuff was done was a string quartet, which you wouldn't normally hear in a musical, but anyway, mm. so that's how the music came about. And then I was basically said to Martin, I've got this piece of narration which describes, I don't know, um, the, the, the train ride from uh, Dobwalls to Plymouth, or I've got this other bit of narration that describes um, the death of uh, Teddy Willis or whatever the, whatever the mm. incident in the story was. And Martin yeah. went away and, with his string quartet and wrote the, uh, the sort of accompanying music for that. In fact, the, the journey to Plymouth, the, the soundtrack to that journey is just absolutely great. So that's how the music came around, about. So it's a bit like the Bible. There's a, a number of different contributors. <laughs> <laughs> May it have as long lasting uh, appeal as yeah. the Bible, <laughs> perhaps without the controversy. Yeah. Um, so how did the... Um, how did the, does the decision to turn it into a podcast and do an audio recording come about? Well, so I decided I was going to make this, this audio. It, originally, I called it an audio book version, but basically mm -hmm. it's a podcast version. And I wrote the script. I then sat down with Martin and we wrote, I said, we need a song here. We need a song here. And this needs to happen in this song. And this needs to happen in this song. And I wrote the words and Martin and I just went about it like we go through stuff. And then we booked the orchestra and we recorded a lot with the orchestra. And then one thing we haven't talked about, Louisa, is the amazing cast. You know, I was just that's next on my list. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we were really lucky because it was the lockdown. So or mm. just coming out of the lockdown. So everyone was available. And yeah. <laughs> so we Jeremy. Uh, had a was working with this school in Sutton um and so we found all the kids from the school in Sutton except the, the they played some of the Cornish kids but I actually got Cornish kids to play the Cornish kids because I wanted the accents to be right and in fact my youngest two kids live on the border between Devon and Cornwall so they played a lot of the Cornish oh, funny. kids and there was this other great kid who played a number of them anyway so I took great pains to make sure we got the accents right. So, for example, mm. I only hired Cornish actors to play the Cornish and the soldiers from New Orleans. Um, what what I found was a lot of the actors, uh, none of them could do the accent, the New Orleans accent. <laughs> and so I had, I found one guy from Georgia who was based in London, a guy called Cordell Mostella. So I got him mm. to play. And then I actually got the other New Orleans voices um, the, the the songs are sung by Lance Ellington 
uh, uh, he plays one of the soldiers who's you may know from Strictly. He's one of the singers on Strictly. But mm. um, Lance is probably the same age as me, and these are all like young soldiers in their 20s. So when Lance spoke the lines, he just sounded too old. So I got, <laughs> I actually went on Fiverr, and I hired a load of actors oh, from funny. New Orleans from Fiverr. So all the accents oh my that, that you hear of the New Orleans guys are proper Louisiana accents. And um, wow. so that's that That was anyway. But coming back to the original thing. So we, we had this cast of kids and we got 20 kids and the, the school had a sound studio in the school. So we went down and we recorded them there and then we got them into a sound studio in London and recorded them there. And that was a deal with one kid. And then Jeremy found um, uh, the Brandon McGuinness who who uh, through the National Youth Music Theatre, Brandon McGuinness is the boy who plays um, uh, Terry and Frankie is the boy who plays Jack. And what you find with the kids when you're using kids is often the parents are more important than the kids. <laughs> you need parents <laughs> who are like happy to take the kids at whatever time to the session and wherever it is. You need really dedicated parents. So mm. Brandon and Frankie's parents were just fantastic. And then, so playing the main roles... We had John Owen Jones, who uh, Ian Virgo, who played Gwyn, is a Welsh actor. And I said, Ian, I need someone who can play a sort of big old Welsh bloke. And he said, oh, you've got to get John Owen Jones, who was like the most famous Valjean in Les Mis or voted the best ever Valjean in Les Mis and the longest ever running Phantom in Phantom of the Opera. And I said to John, mm -hmm. would you like to do this? And, and, and uh, would you read a couple of lines out into your phone and message me them? And he, he did. And he was perfect for it. So we got, you know, the mighty John Owen Jones playing Uncle Jack. Katie Seacombe, Harry Seacombe's daughter. I was at university with Katie. And uh, oh. so I was able to approach Katie, who played Auntie Rose, and again, perfect Welsh accent. So, and then Ian Virgo, I who I knew actually through Jeremy, played Gwyn. So we got three solid guys. And then Rosie Cavaliero, who played Miss Paul Manor and Mum. And she's like in... in um, Wurzel Gummidge, you know, she's a proper comic actress. I was just lucky I was at university with her as well. Me, Katie and Rosie were in the same class. So Rosie oh was goodness. like delighted to do it. And then Rosie introduced me to Marsha Warren, double Olivier award winning, I think it's Dame Marsha Warren, um, or certainly OBE. And she played Granny Peters. And I mean, we haven't even talked about Granny Peters, but what a character. No. <laughs> and so Marsha was happy. And, you know, I sent Marsha the scenes and she was like, this is brilliant. And then, you know, all the studios were empty. And we got this one studio where we were recording the orchestra and the singing. And the studio was really breaking my balls over COVID. Everyone's got to be two meters. They've got to have this test, that and all the rest of it. And I was like, you know. It, I, I, it's costing me a fortune to put this show on. I don't have the resources to pay for all this extra COVID stuff. And it was really stressing me out. And then, so on the whim at the last minute, I phoned up all the other studios in London to see if anywhere else was free. And the first one I phoned up was Abbey Road. And Abbey Road said, oh, as a matter of fact, we've had a cancellation next <laughs> Just a week. little studio down the road. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, oh, we've had a cancellation <laughs> next week. Um, because the, the, the conductor's got to go into quarantine. So we got the studio empty. Um, so we'll give it to you at cost. And uh, so the whole thing, you were half the, all the music was recorded at Abbey Road. So we just had all these lucky breaks with the cast. And, you know, I've since discovered some of the guys we just got singing the smaller roles. Simon Thomas, for example, sings the song about, um, he's from Devon, but he sings the song, um, Come All Ye Jolly Tinner Boys, which is like a Cornish war song mm. that goes all the way back to the Napoleonic Wars. Um, I've mm. since discovered that Simon Thomas is a huge star and he was just like a guy we got along to do some voices one day. And so, you know, there are lots of big names from from the, you know, if you look through the cast, cast list and you're into musicals, you'll recognise a lot of the names there. And I love, there's lots of tie-ins with film life musicals. Well, first of all, I want to say that Katie Seacombe, um, the original composer, Gordon Clyde, also wrote songs for Harry Seacombe. So there's a nice connection oh, there. I didn't know and, that. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> when I was doing a little bit of background research, I, I thought that was a really lovely connection. Um, and 
Katie Seacom uh, played Madame Thenardier in the filmed live version of um, Les Mis at the Gilgood, the stage concert version. That's right. And uh, John Owen Jones is in the um, the Les Mis concerts, and He's uh, in the Evelyn musical Hoskins. At the who, yes. Oh, I, I hope they film that. I'm dying to see it. Um, and Evelyn Hoskins, who played Elsie, was Liesl in The Sound of Music Live. Yeah, we haven't talked about her. She was great. She told me she was in her early 20s because I wanted somebody young playing <laughs> Elsie. And then on like the last day of the last recording, she said, actually, I'm 35, <laughs> whatever she is. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not 35, but she's in her 30s. Oh, I love that. <laughs> yeah, but she was brilliant. She was the one who sang G.I. Bride, mm. which we played earlier. Yeah. Just, oh, like such a stellar cast. And I have to um, mention that Rosie Cavaliero is in Gentleman Jack, which is one of my favorite TV shows of all oh, time. There you go. <laughs> Glorious show. So you've, you've recorded the... You've, uh, you recorded the podcast and you recorded all the the audio um, through this kind of lockdown period, and then and um, you've it, released just, it online. And, and what has happened since? Well, loads of it. You know, um, I, you know, I never met the guy who designed the audio. W one thing that's quite quite funny is is just sort of how you adapt to circumstances. You, you, uh, the same mic that I'm talking to you in now was the mic. You, you know, I recorded all the narrations here. I had actors mm. coming over to my house just to my <laughs> front room just recording stuff you know so we went from abbey road to my front room <laughs> for for the uh <laughs> for the various different recordings at different at different times and you know sometimes i had to get actors over to do pickups because we hadn't recorded lines or whatever mm. anyway um so we've uploaded it to the internet and um you can hear it you know via apple podcasts or or whatever podcast app you use spotify um and google podcasts and if you go to kisses on a postcard.com you can get links to all the uh various ways you can listen to it and we've also got cds that people can buy some people still listen to cds and in fact a lot of people have bought the cds to give them to, to their elder relatives who were evacuated um and mm. We oh, like wow. the the response we're getting from people is exactly like the response that you gave, Louisa. People are just going, "Oh my goodness, it bowled me over." I get the nicest letters every day, uh, uh, or every couple of days. Somebody will send me the nicest message, and if you look at the reviews, you know that it's the podcast it has. People just love it, um, and mm -hmm. you know it made me laugh, it made me cry. The music was beautiful, all this kind of thing. And so I'm just so encouraged by the response that it's been getting, and I'm very grateful. And But my life now is simply trying to get as many people to listen as possible. And um, I just hope that it can, you know, really get them, because these things, you share them and you talk about them, and these things, they get their own momentum and they take on a life of its own. And I'm just trying to sort of push, get the snowball rolling, if you know what I mean. Mm. Do you have plans to uh, bring it to the stage if if the right producer comes along? Oh yeah, if if the right producer <laughs> came along, or I actually think it would make a really good mini series on you know Netflix yes. or Amazon, ten episodes yeah. or eight episodes, each thirty or forty minutes or something. Um, musical, mm. what would you call it? A musical. I think it would it'd be quite groundbreaking as a format because I don't think they've done a sort of a serialized musical on, on Netflix. Um, but I, I think that would be, if there were any of those opportunities, I'd jump at them. And, uh, so yeah, I mean, I, I, I mentioned it before. I think the reason that it maybe didn't get to the West end before is that it was, perhaps it wasn't quite ready because the music wasn't quite ready yet, but also it's just a huge undertaking and there's no existing brand awareness to it. it I, I'm sorry to use that mm. awful kind of corporate term of brand <laughs> awareness, but, you know, whether it's a jukebox musical or a rev revival of a classic, you know, like they're redoing Oklahoma in the West End now. You know, they've all got, mm. you look at the what's the new musical in the West End, the great British Bake Off musical. Well, that's a musical that's got a brand awareness to it. So I think, mm. you know, 
you need that. And so I'm just hoping that the podcast creates that brand awareness, if you like, which means it yeah. kind of de-risks it for any future West End producer or for a Netflix producer. If, if a Netflix producer came along and did it, then, <laughs> then, you'd, then you'd be made for the West End. But So, yes, ultimately, that is, that is my dream to make that happen. Um, mm. But it was I didn't have the means to make that happen, neither financially nor, you know, I, if you want to make a film successful or a musical successful, you have to have powerful allies uh mm. in the business and i don't have those allies but but so i need someone who's got those allies you know to make to make a film successful it's it's only half the battle is making it good the next half of the battle is getting people to watch it and getting distribution and all that kind of thing yeah well i tr i truly hope that as you said that by listening to the podcast uh that it will build that brand awareness and that people will become aware of the story and I hope as moved as I was listening to it and um, the people with, with the connections and the money are, you know, other people that are listening and, and able to give it further life. I think so. I think I used to say it's Oliver, but for Vaki's kids. And, <laughs> uh, and it's that kind of thing. And I do think, like, if you look at the greatest musicals of all time, a lot of them have featured kids very strongly. You know, Oliver, The Sound of Music, Matilda. Um, mm. I, I can't think of mm -hmm. any others now off the top of my head, but there are plenty of them. And, you know, I think this has the potential. Annie. Annie, of <laughs> course. Um, I think that this has the potential to be, you know, in that kind of category of, of, of you know, household name musicals, if it's handled properly. It, the story's powerful enough mm. and the music's good enough. Yeah. I totally agree. Totally agree. Um, Dominic, this has just been so wonderful to be able to talk to you and, and learn more about the history of the show and get dive into the stories a little bit more. I it's just I can't wait to listen to it again now. I have that all of that in my head. Um, we are at my final segment. It's called My Favorite Things, where I ask you my favorite questions. These are a few of my favorite things. To start off with, what is your favorite musical? Well, how funny. You, I wasn't, um, I haven't prepped for this because I didn't know I was going to be asked them. And But Kisses on a Postcard aside, <laughs> I would say my favorite musical is The Book of Mormon, which I just adore. I've been to see it three times oh. and I'd happily go and see it another three times. <laughs> Do you have a favorite filmed live musical? So a musical that has been filmed on stage and then um, broadcast like Hamilton or Come From Away are recent examples. I don't think I've seen a filmed musical, but I did watch, uh, I'm going to say, what's it called? Is it called Country Fair? Uh, um, it was a sort of precursor to uh, Oklahoma. Hmm. I don't think I've seen a staged musical uh, on on um, on TV. The closest I've come is watching old Gilbert and mm -hmm. Sullivan stuff. I love Gilbert and Sullivan, um, and so mm. I watch you know <laughs> loads of that on YouTube. Um, but if you watch some of those old musicals, like I watched State Fair, which was sort of around about the it was kind of similar to Oklahoma but um you watch those old musicals and the way they're filmed it's so close to the stage what the stage show would have been I don't think there even was a stage show of State Fair but you know they're filmed mm. they're, they're more theatrical in the way they were filmed in the 40s and 50s than than they are now so I suppose the closest I've come is Gilbert and Sullivan or State Fair which uh what Gil Gilbert and Sullivan's have you enjoyed on screen? Well, I think the best Gilbert and Sullivan is the Mikado, but I love Ilanthi, I love the Pirates of Penzance. Pirates of Penzance mm -hmm. has got probably the single best uh Gilbert and Sullivan number, which is I am the very model of a modern modern major general, which I <laughs> I do hope I get to play that part before I uh shuffle off my mortal coil. But um, the yeah, so but I love Gilbert. Uh, you know, Gilbert's lyrics are the best. And if you're bored one day, just Google Gil poems by Gilbert. They're great. He wrote great poems as well. 
Oh, interesting. Um, I, I will have to look that up. I, I didn't know that. Um, where do you stand on bootlegs? Ah, oh, that's an interesting question. Um, and the answer is I don't know. But I am very much uh, in my sort of uh, politics. I'm very much a sort of uh, I'm a bit of an anarchist if you know what I mean. I, I, I'm a bit sort of anti-protectionism and all that kind of stuff. And so, you know, and I, I subscribe to that idea, idea that sort of, you know, the thing in, in medieval times, the ideas were considered part of the collective. So mm -hmm. I might have a brilliant idea, but the only reason I've had a brilliant idea is because of something I heard somebody saying the other day, you know, and that's what gave me the brilliant mm -hmm. idea. So I, in fact, I owe that conversation i overheard the other day to the brilliant idea and so songs and things like that were just considered part of the collective and so philosophically i um sort of i'm in that part of the world sort of i wouldn't say i'm pro bootlegs but i'm not as anti bootlegs as some but then again mm. i've had some of my stuff nicked <laughs> it really got me, really got my goat. I was like, I spent ages on that song and I've got the YouTube things and now you're just putting it on your channel and you're taking the credit for it. And I wrote it. So, you know, I have mm. been, I have been the victim of plagiarism before and it's not nice. So I'm going to yeah. stand firmly on the fence over this conversation and say, I'm ambivalent. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. That's really interesting about the medieval idea of um, that the ideas are part of the collective. I really, I, I love framing it in that way. That's really interesting. Yeah. Newton said it as well. When everyone was going to Isaac Newton, oh, you're a brilliant scientist, you're a brilliant scientist. And he said, I couldn't achieve what I'd achieved without the work that all these people had done before me. And it was him who coined mm. the expression standing on the shoulders of giants. Mm. Mm. Oh, I love that. Uh, what stage musicals do you wish had been filmed? Kisses on a postcard, obviously. Uh, <laughs> Strong agree. <laughs> um, Book of Mormon. Mm. There were rumours of a, of a film during lockdown, but it, it nothing has eventuated, so we'll we'll see. Because <laughs> the, there was talk of the original cast coming back, but. They'll be too old. Doesn't hasn't happened to my knowledge. <laughs> oh, the, the original cast will be too old, and they, some of the West End cast now are so good. God, they're good. Well, it's more likely to be filmed in the UK than here because your uh, equity rules and union rules for filming are much easier to deal with than the American ones. So, it it could be very well that the West End cast will be filmed. Ah, oh, how interesting. Yeah. Uh, what would you like to see? What musicals would you like to see filmed in the future? Um, Mary Poppins, by the way, there's another one with kids. Um, mm. I was just thinking of Mary Poppins, you know, re, re, I, I sort of sometimes think redoing an old show. I sort of think it's sort of slightly sacrilege sometimes, Like, don't touch it. It was brilliant. But then again, you know, I thought that about the Pink Panther and then I actually saw the, the remake with Steve Martin several years after it happened. And I was like, oh, actually, this is quite good. But um, <laughs> but yeah. So I'm, I'm 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 for some reason I'm thinking of the sound of music and things like that. But what music? Ask me the question again. What musical would I like to see filmed in the future? Yes. I'm going to just stick with Book of Mormon. <laughs> Keep our fingers crossed. <laughs> yeah, and of course, kisses. Yes. Oh, yes, please. Where can we find you online? You can find me at. Uh, on on at dominicfrisbee.com and I've got various newsletters and things but I don't think you should be interested in me you should be interested in kisses on a postcard and you can find that at kissesonapostcard.com and uh, from there you get taken you know to the to the podcast or to the cd whichever it is you you want to listen to wonderful dominic thank you so much for your time i'll have links to all of that in the show notes and uh, wishing you all the best for the future of Kisses on a Postcard. You're very kind, Louisa. The Filmed Live Musicals podcast is created and edited by your host, Louisa Lyons. Filmedlivemusicals.com is where musicals come home. You can follow us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. 
Shout out and all the thank yous to our wonderful patrons, Josh Brandon, Geraldine Brewer, Belinda Broido, Andy Capone, Elliot Charles, Rachel Esteban, Mercedes Esteban Lyons, Hannah Graneman, James T. Lane, Alison Matthews, Al Monaco, David Negrin, Jesse Rabinowitz and Brenda Goodman, David and Catherine Rabinowitz, Joe Tilliston and Beck Twist. Patrons generously provide financial support to preserve the history of film stage musicals and the creation of one easy place to find them all. If you would like to support the site, receive early access to this very podcast and early access to site content, become a Film Live Musicals patron for as little as $3 a month. Visit filmlivemusicals.com to learn more. If you like what you hear, please leave a review on Apple Music. It really helps to get the word out about the show. I hope you enjoyed this episode and thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.